so we're continuing from the graphs we did in comparative advantage those graphs are always examinable and if there was one graph question you'll get you'll get definitely from that um, usually speaking from yarn in most of the graphs I'll skip are uh, more important that you understand the concepts or the ideas basically what the model is saying what are the assumptions of the model and what are the problems with the model that's more important than the graphs especially for HO onwards. With trade policy in that, they might go through a few of the graphs, but I, I would assume that your knowledge from third year micro and your knowledge from honest micro, who, that these ideas are still fresh, so, and that you remember the graphs from there because basically they are the same models, especially from the HO side and from the trade policy side. Um, Let's go on to the disadvantages of comparative advantage. The first idea is in the real world, specialization doesn't seem to exist. So that is one of the problems. If you look at the real world and you look at the concept of specialization, it doesn't exist. How feasible that is, we don't know. So in essence, comparative advantage does not capture what the real world is showing. The second idea is constant opportunity cost. That is what the model assumes. Who says there's no other type of opportunity cost? Capturing other ideas in that. Um, you can have increasing opportunity costs when it becomes more difficult to shift uh, resources between two products, especially under specialization. The third idea here is economies of scale. Um, the problem of this economies in scale, we always were assuming economies of scale, or, or in the real world, they are usually economies of scale. Because as production increases, you gain more experience, things start to run more smoothly, you start getting the process down to a T. But in the real world, there comes a stage where economy, economies of scale doesn't exist anymore, and this is called diseconomies of scale, where it actually becomes more expensive to produce more. So with specialization, that is more likely to occur, because you're only producing one good on mass scale. So you can read that stage where production just becomes more costly so obviously specialization doesn't take into consideration just economies of scale fourth fact something we might have mentioned before cost of transportation moving goods between countries that it is a cost there exists and that's not taking into consideration the model the third idea here has got to do with your ppfs they don't change so they stay the same throughout whatever changes occurs is more of a static analysis uh, it's more from a statics type of side, so that when you open yourself from autarky to, to world trade and you get a gain, that's a static gain. So we need to talk about the ideas of how does PPF uh, change, and that's not considered in the model. And the whole idea is, if you learn is the quality of labor and the quantity of labor can influence what a PPF, what happens to your possibility frontiers, uh, your production possibility frontiers. You should remember this from third year micro. Factors that change your PPCs or your PPFs are to do with the quality of the resource or quality of the factor of production and the quantity of the factor of production. And that third idea, perfect mobility of factors that we can just swap goods like we want to without any cost towards it. It doesn't, that's not necessary to. Um, and then the last idea here, food security or the second last idea of food security some countries want to ensure that some of the production of their food occurs within their own country because the reliance on food from another country come famine on that is a very dangerous thing and then the last idea is this model ignores everything to do with demand side it's only looking from a supply side so you're not looking at how demand will influence what type of goods you want to produce. And you're also not looking at, is your demand going to be satisfied with what you're producing in that? So that is some of the cons for competitive advantage. And then you can extend the model to more than two countries. Uh, it's not so important. I probably won't test it. Read up on the Balassay index. Um, also probably wouldn't test that. Just knowing that, that's important, and that should have maybe appeared in your summaries in some form. 
but that is probably not what I'm looking for in terms of um, okay, so except in the way that you could uh, bring forth the idea that when extending this model to or most of these models to more than two countries the maths becomes more complicated and actually coming to a resolution you need to use a lot of simply a lot of um, assumptions to get to some simplified answer and that so that is some of the things you can bring forward in your discussion of the essay um, so this is a possible exam question read through it see see what you think about it um, that's how we can put forward similar to what your essay was asking for the third essay in there um, moving on to the HR model so this is the basics I'm not going to go through this your new classical trade model your standard trade model these ideas were all covered in in your micro at some stage were the fact that we are your agents that you have people who supply the labor your laborers who supply the services I mean to both sectors we have capital owners who supply the services and and all these things have some rate or wage rate or rental rate and I'm not going to be looking at this I'm not going to read over you're welcome to read over this in terms of um, brushing up on your micro I, I won't test this but I mean these are the simple things that you would have learnt um, from your micro if you have any issues with reading through these sections and you really want to understand just hit me up um, through whatsapp or whatever and um, I will gladly explain this to you if you get lost in the readings and that. But uh, this isn't. This things uh, should be very familiar when you read through it, um, because of your backgrounds and that. I'm not here to, to teach you any micro. My side is more to do with trade. So, in terms of remembering these things, just uh, maybe a brush up. Maybe you can see where I'm leading to if I draw maybe one simple graph or something like that so you would maybe have pizzas on the one side and robots on the other side or you have labor you have labor the side and you have capital the side so you have capital and say so you had labor and then you would have your graph, your graph was your, your PPF, was a curve PPF, and right, that is your prob uh, production, possibility, frontier, or curve, and then you have to find the margin rate of transfer, transformation, which is related to your ratio of marginal costs, marginal costs of your capital, marginal costs of labor, and you remember those type of things. And then you have to relate it to the demand side. So you'll get, um, firstly, in terms of margin rate of transformation first, from the cost side, you would have something to do with the, um, the cost, the ratio, your factors of, uh, product, of, of production. And you'll find some ratio in terms of your marginal cost. Then from the supply side, you will get some prices. That will cause some, uh, you have your prices here. Then you get your ratio of your prices. And then you would relate that to your demand side. And then you have your demand curve here. And then you have to find the ratio of your marginal utilities in terms of your ratio of your prices of your goods. So this must be familiar. You must remember these type of things. You must remember your offer curves. This is when you open your gate, when you enter into um, some trade with with another country. I'm just trying to draw something familiar, so maybe you remember what it looks like. something like that maybe and this is the point where you find how much exports and imports is and then obviously you get the idea that um, there's some policy on trade that occurs so import tariff is something that affects the relationship here so 
So these are the things you need to remember from your micro and hopefully it was covered. Guess what? If you don't remember these type of things, I'm not testing you on these type of graphs, but this is the things you should kind of remember from your micro side and that. And these are the things I'm going to stay away from, from drawing and that. Because I don't want to concentrate on something it's I'm not going to test. I'm not going to test these graphs. I'm more interested in the concepts and that. So this is the equilibrium stuff I was trying to allure to and that. So you need to read up on these stuff. They are kind of in history for your HR model, but they're not. I'm not really going to discuss the model, so it's fine from that side. Um, you need to maybe remember your theorems. You would have learned the factor price equal equalization theorem, meaning the price of labor and the price of capital will be kind of the same, whichever you country you go to. So whatever it costs you to buy labor here in South Africa will be the same for you to cost same. Even when factoring in exchange and exchange rate and everything will be similar price or exactly the same price maybe in Uganda or something like that. So that's something you need to remember. You can go over the theorem, you can look for the graph. You must remember what factor intensity means. Um, that should be very familiar. Some uh, some products are labor intensive. It means they just use a lot of labor. Um, but you must also understand that any factor intensity that exists it's affected by the, the market inter market intervention. So government government can step in and actually affect how much of a factor you're using in, in a certain goal. Obviously, if there's minimum wage um, introduced, then something that would have been maybe labor intensive would become less labor intensive because labor's prices actually increase. Remember, minimum wage is trying to impose a price which you feel is fair. So that people can survive in that. This is not the living wage, but in essence, you are putting you're putting the lowest price in the market that you could charge for labor, now. and that usually increases the price of wages, which means that anything that was labor intensive would become less labor intensive in production, because you would probably move your production to do towards um, to capital and that. And you should also understand. The idea of physical abundance versus economic abundance when you're talking about factor abundance. So just somebody saying that my country is uh, abundant in terms of labor. So something like China, which is abundant in terms of labor. Uh, even South Africa, in essence, has uh, abundant labor. Or maybe they say cheap labor. Now. But there's a difference between physical abundance and economic abundance. Because you could have a whole lot of land and then you know, a lot of labor, but there's a lot of regulation that exists that prevents you from actually using all the labor and all that that land and that. So just be careful with that. Um, economic abundance would usually take in consideration the laws and that. Well, physical abundance would be just what basically you see there, what is there, what's out there already. Um, so when we deal with economics, we're really doing with economic abundance, taking consideration what laws have been put into place to hamper or to influence the capital intensities and that. So the HO model, so there's two goods, two countries, and two factors of production. This is the two by two by two. We have homothetic taste, meaning that income doesn't influence your ratio of what you buy of your your ratio of your capital to labor. So if or of how you buy your goods. So if you buy two pizzas to every one car, if your income was to double, you'd still buy two in two pizzas to one car. You just won't say, okay, I earn a lot more money. I'm going to buy a lot more pizzas. I'm going to move away from the other type of good. So you keep your ratios constant when you talk about homothetic tastes. Um, we have similar tastes, meaning everybody is quite the same. Every person in this market, um, every country is kind of, oh, sorry, every person, every consumer is the same, yeah? So we all like the same type of things and that. So we're not really different. We're keeping everybody very similar. It makes it easier for the maths. And we have free trade. Um, there's no 
policies, no trade policies. We have constant returns to scale. We have incomplete specialization means we produce both goods in this case. Might produce a lot of one good and a lot of other, but we have incomplete specialization. We have perfect competition. And there's no movements of capital between countries. So that's your normal assumptions. And, and I mean, whatever you feel doesn't hold for the real world, who doesn't own that you, you would attack the assumptions in case in terms of VAT and that. But just remembering homothetic tax it's got to do with the, your ratio staying constant no matter how income is changing for consumers and that. so what does the HR model say the good that you are abundant in the factor that sorry apologies there relating the abundance of a factor so if you the factor that you are abundant in that is the type of good you're going to produce. Very abundant in that factor. So if you are a labor capital or a labor, if you are apologies, just got disturbed there. So when you're dealing to with the abundance of a factor, what the HR model says is the factor that you abundant in. Your good will use that factor abundantly in its production. Meaning, if I'm producing a good and I'm a capital abundant country, then my good would have a lot of capital used in its production. And the type of good I end up with is a, is with a, is a capital intensive good. So, we're basically saying here. Uh, that whatever factor that you are abandoned in, this is what your country is going to be more adept at with using. And in the end, that means because you have a lot of this type of factor and you're using a lot of this in terms of the production, you're going to line up with a cheaper price for that factor because it's abundantly available. Imagine a lot of laborers existing. Tens and thousands of laborers you have in your market and that. So they're going to compete with the other trying to, in essence, they're going to compete in terms of the market, trying to get work in a sense. So they're going to drive down their prices because they are so abundant in that sense. Also because there's so much of them exists, you can just turn to the next guy who's going to be cheaper in that sense. I'm just talking maybe from what you can do with abundant labor. In terms of capital, if there's a lot of capital going around in that. Then in order to solve this, you can't, there's no shortage or anything, so you can't drive up the price now because there's always somewhere else you can go and buy. So that is usually the kind of the concept they're using here is abundant factor means it's more cheaper for, for that factor. The price of the factor would usually be cheaper and if we're using it in terms of production would be more cost effective in that sense. Does it really exist in the real world? Do we find countries that are abundant in the factor? producing the good is that they there's abundant in the factor and we'll catch we'll do that a bit later and we, we can actually see if that it really holds enough because so actor so africa is a labor abundant country in a sense um, are they really doing that is china doing that china is using yes in terms of even if they're producing technology stuff and then what they're doing just a lot of replication and 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 easy cheap technology stuff and what are they using all the labor all the labor that they have actually so it does exist and show when we, but what we're gonna see is that in the end that the other side of the H model has got to do with trade saying okay I'm abandoning capital therefore I'm gonna produce a capital intensive good and therefore I'm gonna export a, a capital intensive good what I'm gonna end up importing I'm gonna import a good that is labor intensive because i'm not producing the labor intensive goods in my country i'm going to import it and now we assume in that goods that are capital tense or different in nature of what a labor intensive good looks like so these are the type of things we're going to look at but just remember that if you're a capital abundant country you're gonna import a labor abundant good and export your capital abundant good. And we're going to see does it really exist in the world, and we're going to find there are 
looking at your United States, there might not be. And this is where some of you are out in your summaries about the Lientif uh, index. So I'm not going to look at the homothetic graph. This basically says if your income or whatever doubles, then you're going to, if your income doubles, you're going to consume double the amount of, of the goods that you were already assuming. So your ratio is just going to stay constant. Whatever ratio income increases, the amount of each of your goods will increase by that same ratio. Can I look at that? It's simply what is export. Export is whatever you produce minus whatever you consume in your country. So there's nothing really here to look at. Um, just remember those kind of things when you're looking at demand side of it. I'm not going to test on this. Um, the only thing here that is probably critical for your for writing your essay is the top line to do with absolute and comparative advantage remember that only consider the supply side and unfortunately the HR model now takes into consideration the demand side it's saying okay we have a consumer how does that affect what are we ultimately exporting and import and what ultimately what we are producing within our country going through this part this is also a graph go and read up on the Rebzinski graph in there and then you do equilibrium condition in terms of trade you can go read up on that you can read about what happens if prices change how does that affect uh, what you're going to import and what you're going to export um go and look at that This is more important limitations of the HO model. So the whole idea is the diamond issue. It says the country really has such and such a, such a factor. So if you're looking at a country that it is capital abundant, it's really assuming it has a capital abundance, and therefore you produce a good that's capital abundant. But what if a country doesn't have any diamonds? Uh, how is it possible then that it's going to trade in that? And we find in the world a country doesn't have certain endowments and yet it trades in that type of good so that's the issue issue here that you assume your country has abundance of goods to enter into trade that is not necessarily a condition of, of trade in that we can find that what some countries do is they enter into relation with another uh, another country they import that factor that they need and then they start manufacturing a good as related to that factor second idea here which is different to the first model the second model there's no specialization so we're finding that both countries are producing both goods which is definitely going to create some inefficiencies right according to what um smith and ricardo would have said is if we had just concentrated on one good and into the trade there would have been some gain in according to them right we're talking here about uh, constant returns of scale in terms of production and we do know usually speaking that in terms of production usually you have some decreasing um returns to scale or some increasing returns to scale depending um so assuming constant returns to scale isn't the the best idea uh, the, the fourth idea is identical technologies so we have the type same type of knowledge or knowledge and other factors throughout and we all know every country does not have the same technologies we do not have the same pool of technologies we're just assuming that we're saying they the only thing they differ in terms of factors but everything else is the same so yeah it doesn't really hold for the real world we're also assuming commodity pricing is being the same that purchasing power parity holds we're not assuming there's any transactional costs and we're not assuming looking at what productivity how that impacts on commodity pricing and that and then there's an empirical application to the HR model um, so this is a Leontief uh, index so what the Leontief uh, index uh, looks at is okay let's see let's look at America and we get and let's see if Assuming they are a capital intensive country, which they kind of did 
which are the claim to be, which are the are, we look at, okay, are America, which is a capital intensive country, exporting a capital intensive good and importing a labor intensive good. And when they actually looked at it, what happened? They found that being a capital abundant country, they still imported capital intensive goods and they actually exported labor intensive goods. It was contrary to what the HO model was trying to say. So they tried to find some reasons for this. And the two reasons they found was first from a demand buyer side. So that means. So moving back to demand bias, what demand bias means here in terms of one of the reasons that try to find for why the Lee and Tiffy paradox was found, um, they found that maybe it is that all the demand, America being a labor intensive country, maybe they have a large demand for labor intensive, sorry, apologies. So we're talking about capital intensive, so America being capital intensive good. Uh, ten, capital intensive country what we find that they have a large demand for capital intensive goods so even though they're producing capital intensive goods they can't meet the demand so all the capital intensive goods America is demanding it they're buying it now they're falling short they still need to fill that demand for capital in intensive goods for their own population so what they end up having to do is to import those goods from across the world so that was one of the reasons being they didn't meet the demand for their capital intensive goods within the country the second idea here is the factor intensive reversal that it just means that if you look at it closely right in america right if you if you look at what they produce say they produce a computer so the Apple, so Apple is what they're producing, they're producing Apple computers, and we're looking at China, and they're producing Hawaii. So we all know there's a rivalry between the countries, but let's look at this that way. So their computers that Apple is producing uses a lot of capital, so they're using a lot of labor-intensive type of goods. And then we look at um, China, and that... A Y computer that they are producing actually is very labor intensive in terms of its production. So in China, they're using a lot of labor to produce the computer, while in America, they're using a whole lot of capital producer goods. So America now is importing from NY a labor intensive good, this Hawaii computer, into the country. So from a face type of view, when you look at it, you're thinking, hey, the, there's a computer coming in. This computer, in its nature, when you look at production of computers, it is very capital intensive. So when Leontief was doing this type of work and he was finding, oh, they importing computers, they importing it there for labor, uh, capital, sorry, capital intensive good, then they weren't actually looking at but this computer is coming from China and because it's coming from China that type of good is actually very labor intensive so in the end if you take into consideration factor intensity reversal then the Leontief paradox is incorrect because what they're actually importing America they are importing a labor intensive good but it just appears as a capital intensive good because we assuming that type of good like a computer is capital intensive and that's it that's the main part of this lecture um there were other models inserted in the slides but i removed them and that's what i uploaded so you're welcome to go and look up and read up a few of these other models just get one or two and research them and see what they're about um that's it for these trade models and that. Um, we will be moving on to trade policy soon.